Hey, what is up, mortals? It is Jennifer Sathwaker here with a new video for you. Welcome to part 18 of What If Deku Had a Super Speed Quirk. I just wanted to greet you guys by saying sit back and relax. You're in for a treat. So we begin. Mirio stopped once he was at the blocked doorway. He pressed his left ear against the fallen debris in an attempt to hear the plea for help better. The blonde-haired boy heard a child calling out for someone to save his parents who were trapped. Mirio then examined the debris blocking the doorway to see if he could move the debris out of the way. The doorway was blocked by wooden beams that had fallen when the roof collapsed. Lemillion looked around and noticed the fire in the building was nearing the blocked-off room. Sir, I need Kurigiri here. I need him to move some of the debris out of the way. There are at least three people trapped behind some debris. Lemillion calmly said into his radio as he watched the flames encroach his location in the building. At least two of the victims are trapped under some debris. It's too risky for me to use my quirk, since I don't know what the inside of the room looks like. Very well. Kurigiri is on his way. I have Centipeter tracking everyone's movements. He was still at the agency when everything went down, Sir Night Eye said over the radio. He then turned to Kurigiri and pointed at a map of this city as he said, Kurigiri, you need to warp over to this building and help Lemillion. There are at least two injured people there. Once you warp in, follow Lemillion's instructions. Very well. I will make sure that everyone is evacuated from the building. Where do I warp the injured? Kurigiri asked as he formed a portal next to him using his right hand. Do you want me to return here once I finish helping Lemillion? Warp them to a hospital on the west side of the city. There's a disturbance on the outskirts of the east side of the city, Night Eye said as he looked at the man. Yes. Return here once you've finished. If anyone asks about what you're doing, have them contact me. Kurigiri bowed at the pro hero before stepping into the portal. The man with glowing yellow eyes was greeted by the orange glow of the fire that was engulfing the building. The well-dressed man walked over to Mirio. The portal closed behind Kurigiri as he opened another portal with his left hand. He stuck his head into the portal to see the situation inside of the room. He took in the scene quickly. A toddler was crying for help. A pool of blood was forming under a pile of debris in the back left corner of the room. In the center of the room was a large pile of debris covering a man and a woman. And finally, the debris blocking the door had fallen on top of an elderly woman who was also bleeding heavily. Kurigiri reported the situation to Lemillion. Mirio made sure to keep a smile on his face as he considered all of his options. A sudden thought occurred to him as he remembered the report about the attack on USJ. Kurigiri, are you able to drop people or items in different locations once they're in your portal? Lemillion calmly inquired as he started to panic internally. If you can do that, then I have a plan that might work. If I know the locations where you want me to drop each item or person off, I can do it. Kurigiri calmly said as he looked at the young hero. What do you have in mind? You teleport me outside so I can continue to search for people who need rescuing. Then I need you to create a portal inside the room, deposit all the debris and furniture to a different part of the building, and transport the people to the hospital. I've already checked the other rooms in this building, and there were no other victims. Mirio calmly explained, sounding more confident than he actually was. When you're finished, head back to Sir Night Eye. He will know where you're needed the most. Very well. Be careful, young man. I am sure these villains will create more mayhem before they stop, the glowing yellow-eyed man said as he turned and stepped into a portal. Night Eye said there was a disturbance on the east side of the city. Make sure any citizens you see head west. Mirio nodded as a portal formed under him. As Lemillion passed through the portal, he braced himself for the horrors he was about to encounter. Meanwhile, the dark purple portal Kurigiri created engulfed the room that was blocked off and sucked everything inside. Kurigiri then opened a portal inside the largest room of the building and deposited all of the debris into it. He then transported every person inside of his portal to the nearest hospital on the west side of the city. Borealis arrived at a four-story building on the east side of the city. The second and third floors had massive holes in the exterior walls. The bright orange glow from the fire burning on both floors was made all the more terrifying by the screams he heard coming from inside the building. Izuku swallowed hard as he prepared himself for what he would find inside the building. Just before entering the building, he plastered a smile on his face. 
The first floor gave him a false hope, as the 20 people he found all had minor injuries. Izuku quickly had them leave the building as he moved on to the second floor. Despite the intense heat, Borealis quickly reached the second floor. The first thing he saw was a burned and crushed corpse. A bookshelf and part of the ceiling had fallen on the person. Flames were still burning around the body. His smile briefly faltered as he saw what the rest of the second floor looked like. The tiled floor of the second floor was littered with jagged debris. Blood was splattered everywhere. As Borealis took a step forward, his right foot landed on something. When he looked down, Izuku realized he had stepped on a severed hand, causing him to gag. He took a deep breath in an attempt to steady his nerves. However, the putrid smell from the burning corpses had the opposite effect. Borealis barely had enough time to remove his mask before he vomited. He quickly wiped his mouth with his sleeve and replaced his mask on his face. The emerald-eyed boy quickly reached for his radio as he realized he was in way over his head. Although his homeroom teacher had shown the students graphic photos of the destruction All for One had caused during his attack at the hospital, they failed to prepare him for the situation he was in. As he moved farther into the second floor, he saw a person impaled by a wooden beam. Night Eye, I'm in way over my head. I need help. I won't be able to save everyone in this building without help, Borealis said as he tried to keep his composure. Do you have any advice on how to handle a situation like this? Borealis, calm down. You're doing fine. Remember to calmly examine the situation. Night Eye advised as he tried to help Izuku maintain his composure. Tell me what you are seeing and hearing. Don't leave anything out. Yes, sir, Izuku said as he began to describe the situation in detail. I've notified other heroes in your area about the situation. However, because the attack is so widespread and the destruction is so great, help is unlikely to come quickly, Sir Night Eye sourly said over the radio. Kuragiri is on his way to help you. I know you can deal with this situation. You handled USJ and the UA Sports Festival. Aside from the gore, this isn't different from those incidents. Just assess the situation and pick the best course of action. Stay safe. Yes, sir, the green-haired boy said as he tried to clear his mind. Izuku looked around the room and noticed the blazing inferno weakened as it got closer to the windows or exterior walls that were destroyed in the explosion. Borealis heard a loud creak as the support columns in the building began to give way. The green-haired boy found a man trapped under some rubble. Despite the man's plea and the pool of blood forming around him, the emerald-eyed boy knew he was going to need help freeing him. A dark purple portal appeared beneath the man. The man quickly fell into the portal because of the debris resting on top of him. Izuku stood in shock as he heard more explosions. He quickly made sure a smile was on his face and continued his search for victims. Less than 30 seconds later, he felt something fall onto him. As he looked up, the floor beneath him gave out, and as he fell, he noticed the second floor ceiling begin to collapse. Borealis berated himself silently for being so careless. He quickly sent his quirk into overdrive and sprinted back up the stairs. Sir, the building is beginning to collapse, Borealis reported in as he searched for the safest path to save everyone. Borealis saw a small, faint green line as he reached the second floor. A portal formed near the green-haired boy as he started to move. As Kuragiri stepped out of the portal, he heard the groaning of the building as it slowly started to collapse. Without need for any instruction, he followed Borealis. The first victim they came to was an elderly man trapped under some furniture. Moments after Izuku rescued the man and Kuragiri had warped him to the hospital, the ceiling above the pile of furniture collapsed. As Borealis and Kuragiri entered another room on the second floor, the ceiling above them began to fall. The man with the glowing yellow eyes quickly formed a portal in front of them and they slipped through the gap in the falling concrete. Izuku found himself about six feet ahead of where he had been. The green-haired boy quickly sprinted over to a person lying in a pool of blood. The man with glowing yellow eyes appeared next to Borealis and, without saying a word, transported the debris to the first floor. He then warped the injured man to the hospital to receive medical treatment. Thank you for helping me avoid the debris, Izuku muttered as Kuragiri disappeared into a portal. Borealis, remember, you don't have to hold back. Heroes from other cities are responding, Night Eye grumbled over the radio. Remember to stay calm. Each time you save a victim, you're improving the situation. 
Kurigiri reformed in the building to find a group of people waiting outside of a burning room. Kurigiri quickly placed a portal underneath them and carefully transported the group outside of the building. Over in the south side of the city, Ingenium and Overhaul were running down a narrow street. A woman with lilac-colored hair walked out of a building across the street from them. Overhaul reached out and grabbed the provisionally licensed hero and pulled him back. About ten feet in front of them, the street had taken on a yellow glow. Using the tip of the mask he was wearing, Overhaul removed the glove from his right hand. He then placed his right hand on the ground at his feet. Ida watched as the ground around him started to move rapidly into place. Overhaul used his quirk to turn the ground around them into a barrier. Just as the explosion occurred, the buildings surrounded them started to glow yellow. This situation reminds me of someone the boss met a while ago. It had something to do with him speaking with a woman from the Meta Liberation Army. I'm trying to remember what he said about the woman. Overhaul grumbled as he reformed the ground he was touching into four massive walls to protect them from the impending explosion. If I'm remembering this correctly, the boss said she had lilac-colored hair and that her quirk allows her to bestow explosive properties to whatever she touches. Did he mention the woman's name? Ida asked in frustration as an almost deafening series of explosions occurred around them. Doesn't your boss require you to know this kind of information? The boss shouldn't mention important information like this when I'm training Aerie. Out of everyone in the family, he should know the best that Aerie can't control her quirk just yet. Chizaki shouted in an attempt to be heard after the noise died down. I remember, her name started with the letter C. A few more seconds and I should be able to tell you what her code name is at least. Overhaul used his right hand to pull off the white glove on his left hand. The ground started to flatten out as the man returned the ground to the way it had been originally. On both sides of the street, the buildings had been reduced to large piles of rubble from the explosions. The duo heard a loud ringing sound in their ears from the explosions. Once the ringing in their ears subsided, Ida used his radio. Sir, we need assistance. A series of explosions leveled a city block. Ida grumbled into the radio as he stared at the destruction in shock. Overhaul said that the perpetrator's quirk allows her to bestow explosive properties to anything she touches. Mirio mentioned that earlier. The closest help is about ten minutes away. Sir Nighteye calmly said over the radio as he delivered the bad news. Ingenium, most of the destruction is happening on the east and the north sides of the city. The Hero Public Safety Commission just informed me that the villain was last seen on the south side of the city. Try and apprehend her if the situation presents itself. Ida stopped for a few seconds and listened to the noise in the city. The first thing he noticed was the faint rumble of thunder mixed into the sound of explosions going off. Overhaul used his quirk again and reshaped the ground to form a pathway over the rubble. As the two approached the location where the woman with the lilac hair was reported to have been located, the rumble of thunder started to grow louder. Chizaki put his gloves back on his hands as he walked towards the source of the explosions. The name continued to escape him as he looked around the area for any clues. The first thing he noticed was an undamaged media badge lying on the ground. Overhaul crouched and picked up the badge. Just as he had an epiphany, a man dressed in a t-shirt and jeans punched Chizaki in the face with his right hand. The man turned yellow moments after he landed the blow. Angenium quickly dove behind some rubble in an attempt to find cover. As the man exploded, several other explosions went off simultaneously. As the light from the explosion faded, Ida was able to see what happened to his partner. He saw that Chizaki's right arm had been severed at the shoulder, and Chizaki was touching his right shoulder with his left hand. Blood was dripping from multiple locations on his body. The right side of Overhaul's face was horribly burned. As time went on, Ida noticed that something started to form in the air where Overhaul's right arm should have been. Within moments, Chizaki's right arm had been reformed. The man wearing the Plague Doctor's mask touched the right side of his face, and the burns rapidly disappeared. That was disgusting. I can't believe someone actually touched me. I can't wait until we catch up with that bitch. I remember the boss meeting with a woman named Curious. Chizaki growled in frustration at being touched. This makes my blood boil, though I'm starting to understand why the boss didn't want to work with the Meta Liberation Army. Is the name of the culprit behind this called Curious? Is now really the time to be angry that someone touched you? Ida asked, slightly concerned about the man's priorities. 
You're bleeding in several places, and the first thing you're worried about is that someone touched you. That was the name she gave the boss when she met with him. I'm a germaphobe, so yes, it bothers me that someone touched me. Overhaul growled in frustration at being questioned. However, you're correct. I should focus on the battle at hand. I'm sure that woman has more tricks up her sleeve. If the injuries start causing problems for me, I'll just use my quirk to heal them. Do you have any idea where the woman would have gone after she tried to blow us up? Surely you figured something out? Ida asked as he looked at the second-in-command of the local Yakuza. You were looking at a badge when the person attacked you. Overhaul simply stayed quiet and started walking west. They arrived at a small building that had been blown up. A woman was trapped under some rubble as fire slowly started to encroach on her location. Chizaki simply grabbed the woman and dragged her out of the medium-sized pile of debris. He noticed the woman had several deep gashes in her upper body. Overhaul noticed that the woman's legs were broken and twisted at awkward angles. The man wearing the plague doctor's mask activated his quirk. The woman was disassembled in a moment and then reassembled an instant later. Chizaki instructed her to head west before they noticed the ground started to tremble slightly. The rain was now falling heavily. Strong winds coming from the east helped strengthen the fires. Overhaul looked at Ida and motioned for him to follow, and then he started walking towards a street that was surprisingly crowded. Shouldn't we ask Kurigiri to help us evacuate these people? Ida asked when he saw everyone crowding the street. Our job is to protect the innocent people in this city. We are, and that's why we need to defeat the people in front of us. These are most of her pawns. Given what's going on, the civilians would have sought shelter to avoid the rain and the constant explosions going off. The man wearing a plague mask said harshly. The only people who would be outside and moving around aside from the heroes are the villains responsible for the attack. Most civilians will try to stay indoors, if they can. Don't we need proof that these people are criminals before we take action? Ingenium nervously asked as he tried to think of a plan. These people from the Meta Liberation Army might be using them as a shield to protect their operations. That's why we aren't hiding. The civilians won't attack us if a fight breaks out. However, her forces will. Overhaul calmly muttered as he looked at the young hero. If we can present the civilians the opportunity to flee, then they'll take the opportunity to flee. I highly doubt the Curious would have invested that much time to blackmail every single civilian who lives in the area. Ida quickly activated one for all as the duo walked into the crowded street. The noise of people talking rapidly disappeared as they looked at the newcomers. Slowly, the crowd turned towards them and started to charge at them. Overhaul placed his right hand on the ground and activated his quirk. The ground rapidly changed as Chizaki shaped the ground the way he wanted it. Ingenium watched as a massive sinkhole appeared in the ground. Before Chizaki could create a barrier, about 20 people started to glow yellow. Ida pushed one for all to 60%. The blue-haired boy grabbed Chizaki as he jumped over the hole. Just as the two of them landed on the other side of the hole, a massive explosion went off. Ingenium quickly lowered the percentage of one-for-all he was using to 10%. Otherwise, he risked breaking Chizaki's bones. Overhaul simply nodded his thanks and then motioned for Ida to follow him. They arrived at a large plaza that had a news agency on its north side. Just as they entered the plaza, people started leaving their homes. In a few moments, Overhaul and Ingenium were surrounded by people. We need to head towards the news agency. It belongs to the culprit behind these bombings. Remember, we're in her territory now. Overhaul calmly grumbled as he started releasing his murderous intent towards the people surrounding them. I'm glad the boss pushed me down the right path. I'd hate to be a fanatic like these people. Have they even questioned their leader's ideology? It doesn't make sense. Sure, he wants people to be able to freely use their quirks, but he never explains how. Do you think that these people are rigged to blow up if they get close to us? We've encountered a lot of people willing to blow themselves up to keep us away from here. Ida asked with concern as he scanned all the people surrounding the two of them. We've only seen one woman. Surely there's a limit to how many people or items she can use her quirk on. Don't get your hopes up. The Meta Liberation Army recruited a villain called twice into their ranks. Chizaki muttered in frustration as he considered their options. 
His quirk allows him to clone people. From what I've heard, the clones fall apart easily. However, they can use the same quirk as the original, meaning everyone here might be rigged to explode, but by a clone instead of the original. Then how do we handle the situation if our opponents could turn into bombs? Ida asked, terrified at the prospect of getting blown up repeatedly. What happens if we manage to destroy the clones? Would the effects of her quirk disappear if it didn't come from her? I don't think so, but it's the only plan we have, so let's give it a shot. Overhaul growled as he placed his left hand on the ground. The ground rapidly started to change as Chizaki's quirk flowed into it. Ten 60-foot-tall pillars formed out of the ground. Spikes then started to shoot out of the ground and embed themselves into the pillars. Overhaul placed his right hand on the ground and encircled both of them in a 20-foot-high wall. He then changed the ground underneath them into a 60-foot pillar. After that, he stood up and examined his handiwork. That should buy us enough time to enter the building over there. Otherwise, it should make the area easier for us to fight in. Chizaki calmly said as he watched people trying to scale the pillars. Hopefully more heroes arrive so we can make sure the clones that are currently causing all this mayhem are stopped. I'm going to see if I can make this a little easier for us, the blue-haired boy said as he grabbed Overhaul. If we can't afford to fight out in the open, then why don't we change the location where we are fighting? Overhaul nodded as Edith started leaping from pillar to pillar. Despite his revulsion at the idea of someone touching him, Chizaki had to agree with the pragmatic approach the boy took. Just before Ingenium could jump to the last pillar, a series of explosions occurred. As the dust cleared, the duo could see that the pillar had been destroyed by the explosions. Thank you all for indulging yourselves in the story thus far. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, there are a few more things that I'd like to go over before the video ends. Firstly, we've got a second channel called Anime Deep Dive. Anime Deep Dive goes deep into the facts and lore of a wide variety of anime. It's sure to expand your weeb knowledge for all kinds of series, guaranteed. On top of that, we have a third channel called We the Celestials Naruto What If. It's what we do on this channel already, but in the vast world and lore of Naruto. Go check it out if you're in the mood for some jutsu action. Secondly, on behalf of We the Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. Lastly, if you're interested in what we do here at We the Celestials, then I would like to extend out an invitation to join the team. The only caveat being we only accept members 16 years and up to join our crew. You can sign up for whichever category fulfills your interests by joining the recruitment discord using the link in the description below. Our discord is an all-around fantastic place to be, whether you're a fan or looking to join our band of misfits. We're always looking for members to join us. Well, that's it from us for today's video. So thank you all for watching and have a great day.